All right, here we go. So, um, so you grew up in New York, right? Like whereabouts, like Manhattan or whereabouts in New York? Yeah, that's right. I uh, grew up in Harlem first, and then uh, and then moved down to um, the Upper West Side. Upper West Side, yeah. nice. Not too far from Harlem. Harlem, yeah. You know? Same, yeah. Pretty much the same, the same idea. Just a few blocks down. I lived in the Lower East Side for a few years and in Queens, so I know the area a little bit. Cool, yeah. Love it. <laughs> amazing, amazing times. Great stuff. Yeah. But when you were growing up, now I know there's people in, in music in your family, but do you, do you remember, what were your like first early recollections of listening to music? Like, what was the first thing that you remember hearing when you were, you know, just a little kid? Yeah, I remember the Jackson 5's third album. I remember listening to that and was just blown away by the, the colors, the sound, the singing, the songwriting. And um, I, I wanted to emulate Michael Jackson. So I, I literally made my voice sound exactly like his on that album. And um, <laughs> I think that, <laughs> that inspired me a lot. And then I found my father's um, Beatles collection. And oh. uh, I fell in love with those sounds and, and um, the colors. And it just had like a... I don't know, it kind of had like a, it was like a jungle of instruments and notes and melodies and, and stuff. So I, I really enjoyed that. So those two albums, I would say, or those two artists were very inspirational for me. Were you listening to records? Like vi yes. vinyl? Oh, yeah. yeah. They were LPs. Yeah. yeah. That's oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know you have some famous uncles in your family, which we're going to talk about a little. Did that have any impact at you with you on an early age? Oh, I'm sure. You know, my um, when my mom's water broke, uh, I was literally at a James Brown concert. <laughs> oh, no, really? <laughs> oh, so, yeah. My uncles, Melvin and Maceo, were on stage and my father and my mom were at the show. You know, it was in uh, Washington, D.C. because that's where I was born in Georgetown. And uh, they were like, oh. Time to leave. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Now, now I understand. I read somewhere that you started playing guitar probably around like eight or nine years old. Yes, yes, I did. And then you studied jazz guitar as well as classical music. I have to ask you this question: You went to the Manhattan School of Music. Yes, sir. Did, did you did you know David Volkhausen, Mister Volkhausen, music theory? Does that ring a bell? No, I, the name sounds familiar, but no, I didn't. Definitely didn't study with him. He, my a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. It's, it's her father, and oh. he thought he taught he thought he taught music theory there. So I figured I would ask. Oh, okay. He might have been a little late after me. That's so. cool. So, <laughs> what was it like going to Manhattan School of Music? Was that a good experience for you? It was. It was amazing. It was a huge challenge um i never learned so much in my life in, in any school whatsoever um i learned philosophy i learned obviously jazz guitar music history uh, classical music history jazz music history um a little bit of songwriting jazz piano incredibly uh um educational and um you know i i've, I've got a lot of failing grades or almost failing grades for the first semester and then i've worked my ass off and uh got some coaching from my father and then became a, a straight A student and made the Dean's list. At that point in time, were you more into like jazz and, and classical and stuff than you were rock? Cause you later have become more rock, but I mean, at that time, was it more jazz? And Yeah, I was, I was always a rocker, but then uh, when um, it was time to figure out what my college situation would be, we decided to go with something I didn't know. I did. I knew nothing about jazz. So I uh, just listened to jazz all the time and learned jazz, understood jazz, and spent those four years focusing on jazz and classical. And it wasn't soon thereafter that you finished school that you went on the, a, a world tour with Uncle Maceo, right? That's right. That's right. That was my first um, foray into uh, performing overseas. And I remember the very first show was in uh, Cologne, Germany, and we had zero rehearsals, so I was extremely nervous. Yeah, uh, we had a sound check and they were just basically like, just stay in D. Everything's in the key of D. I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you, it, like, it's, it, was it really a world tour? Did you go like to a lot of countries? Oh, yes. It's, it, we've gone to more countries still to this day than I have with Chanel Monet. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. We've been to more countries, more cities. Maceo's tour was very extensive. We went into the little nooks and crannies of each country. 
was that a nervous experience for you at such a, like you were what in early 20s right yeah yeah i was at first it was it was scary because well, I'm going to germany for the first time i've only read in books you know german history so i was a little, a little concerned uh, but they were the sweetest people I, I could not believe it you know they were the, the men were so excited to see us they were kissing us on the cheek and hugging us and stuff really yeah so i was just like wait a minute let me just go, get, go ahead and throw away the information i have on what i expected them to be and you know loving awesome people um you know of late obviously <laughs> uh yeah but it, it was you know it was very um it was very educational and a lot of fun you know meeting all these new people and 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 getting the um the energy of the european uh, music fan you know they were americans love music obviously we love music here but when americans go to europe oh my goodness the, it, it, i felt like a beetle <laughs> you know? and you know what it's, i know a lot of garage rock bands that go there and play clubs and it's like they're treated like rock stars there exactly. you know even exactly even at the club level you know right never right. mind the arena level <laughs> oh my goodness yes so when you finished that tour, I guess you started playing with Janelle pretty much right after that. And she brought you in to play lead guitar. But as time went on, you wrote songs, whether you arranged. What was it like at first? Because I know you work, you probably still work with, you still work with Janelle now? Yes, I do. You guys have had a long relationship. What was it like when you first met? How did that all happen? And how did it lead up to you being in her band? Yeah, we met um, back in 2006, and um, Chuck Lightning, one of her producers, happened to see me in a studio in Atlanta, Georgia at the time, and he wanted my number so I could work with him on a project, um, and uh, we we did that for a little bit in the studio, Wonderland Studios in Atlanta, and uh, Janelle heard me and said, I want to work with him too, and you know, so I, I did a little, um, a little work on the uh, Metropolis album, I helped arrange Many Moons, and um, that song went on to be uh, nominated for their first Grammy nomination. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and the rest is history. But it was a lot of fun playing those small clubs in Atlanta at the time. Um, Apache Cafe, Smith's Old Bar. And then Smith's, going to... I've been there. I've been yeah, to Smith's Old Bar. Yeah, Good place. Yeah, great place. Yeah, I just yeah. played there last, yeah, a couple of weeks ago with my band. But, uh, but then we did South by Southwest. I think that was the turning point. Yeah, that's always a good one to do. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, a couple of highlights that I wrote down here was I saw the performance, I remembered it, and then I went back and watched it at the Nobel Peace Prize performance of Cold War. Yes. That had to be one of the highlights of your music career. Yes, you get that. You got that right. Prince um, always said that that was his favorite performance of Cold War. Really? Yes. Yeah, the she was on fire. You guys were all on fire in that. And you had the like the orchestra behind you. Yes. And that was really good. Yeah, we had our our arc orchestra and the actual orchestra of the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And it was very emotional and beautiful. Uh, Evanescence played there as well that night. And um, it was really spectacular. I love Oslo, Norway as well. The other the other thing, the other highlight that I wrote down was when you guys were on Colbert. That was an unbelievable performance. Turntables, was it? Yes, yes. Yes, that was a lot of fun. Well, you've been on TV a lot, haven't you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, Turntables <laughs> was um, was a little bit different because we it was during COVID, so we shot yeah. that in the studio in L.A. Um, but, yeah, I, I think we did Colbert in person prior to that, and SNL and a whole bunch of shows, Ellen DeGeneres and, you know, David Letterman. That's, he, he's my favorite. What? Really? You like yeah, Letterman? Like Letterman yes. So how different is it for you to do a TV performance compared to just do a regular show? Um, the nerves, you're, you're just way more nervous when it's a live television performance. I mean, there's something about that, that, you know, that clicker, you know, three, two, one, you're on, you know. Um, that makes you nervous. Also, Letterman, for example, the Ed Sullivan Theater is very, very cold. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so when you're cold, you're even more nervous. I mean, if you're warm, okay, I can kind of chill. I can stretch out and relax. But when you're cold, uh, it just reminds you of how nervous you are. You know, you mess up. You've messed up on live television. Yeah, you don't want that. So you have to go through a lot of makeup and stuff like that, too, right? right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, especially me, so I can keep my young features. <laughs> <laughs> um 
You mentioned Prince before, so if I don't ask you about Prince, I'll be in a lot of trouble because I watched the, that video, this one video that I found where you guys are doing a dueling guitar thing. Right. How did how did you end up playing with Prince? I mean, that's like a dream come true right there, right? Big time. I mean, I don't know. That was uh, kind of, um, it was divine. You know, uh, I remember we were in L.A. doing a show with Raphael Sadiq and um, Prince, uh, Prince, I'm not sure who was his girlfriend, but Prince's uh, DJ at the time um, uh, was on the phone with Prince and she gave the phone to Janelle and she, she said, uh, Janelle, here's a phone call for you. And she gets the phone. She goes, uh, hello, Prince. And I was like, uh oh, what's going on here? And so she goes, oh, your house tonight? Jam session with my band? Sure. So we ended up uh, driving to his house. And I remember our manager was like, oh, my goodness, I have Prince's address in my phone. Like, we're literally going to Prince's Beverly Hills house right now. And we walk in there and there he is, you know, um, he had a cane at the time. I think he just had surgery. And, uh, you know, he was having a jam session with his band. Uh, the house was gorgeous. And um, ever since then, we've been uh, friends and in touch. And, you know, we've done a lot of jam sessions at his house. That video that you're talking about was the first time we ever I ever played with him on stage. I'd already played with him quite a lot at home, you know, but um, he was doing his set after we had opened for him at Madison Square Garden. And during the song, um, she gets in my hair, he comes downstairs to the backstage. There's this door where you can see him from, from underneath because the stage was shaped as a symbol. And um, he says, Kalindo, you, do, you, do you know the song? I'm like, uh, he says, come on stage now, come on. So I was... <laughs> Wow. Oh, yeah. so that wasn't planned at all? No, not at all. Ooh. I was really not. I didn't want to do it because I was watching and, you know, I was pretty nervous. They didn't know if I knew the song, but it turned out to be the highlight of that night for sure. That's fantastic. I had no, I don't think anyone, most people wouldn't know that. They would think that it was a planned performance. It seemed so smooth. It was so smoothly done. I don't know. Um, because he said my rig was still up on the stage anyway, so all I have to do was just get up on the stage and pick up my guitar and play. So, wow, you must have been like freaked out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, dude, the the bands I saw on that stage, you know, Queen and and Kiss and all, you know, all these great bands, Cheap Trick, you know. So to be on that stage uh, performing with Prince was a dream come true for real. Incredible, man. Yeah. Wow. Um, some of the other people here, um, I'm not sure if you actually played with these people or open for them. Stevie Wonder, no doubt, Bruno Mars. I mean, was it opening for them? Yeah, it was mostly opening for them. Uh, the only times I've played with them would be, you know, we do joint performances like the Grammys with Bruno Mars. Um, we did songs together. Uh, no doubt we did a song at the end of the tour together, you know, um, what was the other one? Stevie Wonder, I played with him for a few shows. We did a couple of songs with him, but I was never their guitar player. You know what I mean? I've always been Janelle Monet's guitarist and uh, and my guitarist. I'm the guitarist for Kalinda. <laughs> I, we're going to talk about your stuff. Don't worry. I'm just trying to go through your career because you have a fa fantastic career here. Um, I could definitely see you playing with No Doubt, by the way. I think that would be a really good match for you. I love know? those guys. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, you toured with Amy Winehouse too, right? Right. That's right. We opened for her in Brazil. Wow. So what was that like? Oh, man, it was it was kind of magical, you know, um, being around such a legend. I knew she was a legend and, and a timeless legend at the time. And I cherished every moment, you know, uh, it kind of felt like touring with um, Janis Joplin or somebody, you know, it had to, it just had that vibe to it, you know. Yeah. Cool. And this was in Brazil? Yeah, so it was only a Brazilian tour. Um, I think it was my first time. I'm not sure. I think it was my first time in Brazil. I'm not sure about that. But um, I do remember playing Rock and Rio. I'm not sure if that was with her, but that was incredible. There must have been 200,000 people in the audience. Was that with Janelle? That was, yes. Really? Rock and Rio? <laughs> yes. Wow, that's a big, big festival every year. Huge, really huge. Yeah, I think Stevie Wonder was after us so we were basically opening for him on that on that lineup that's fantastic man yeah. when, now you started recording um you, you started doing stuff on your own around 2018 i believe 
I, I've seen the video when flowers could dance, which is a real, I got to ask you about that video. Whose idea was it to do? Where was that footage from as well? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <We're probably laughs> public domain. Um, I think I know at the time we didn't have a budget at all to shoot a video and we were desperate to do something. So my manager at the time came up with the idea of using old stock, old footage. And so we hired somebody to do that. And, you know, I think for what it was, he did a great job. But, you know, if I had it, if I had it over again, I'd get the band and, you know, in the studio or somewhere on site and rock it out. So you never know. We might uh, re-release that song and, and get a band video. What, what, what was the impetus for you to go solo? I mean, were you just were you want was that your goal all along or did you decide that it was time? Yeah, I had a solo career prior to playing with Janelle that I was one 100 percent getting ready to to go full forge ahead on. And then when I met her, I decided, OK, I'll put this on hold for a little bit. And that little bit turned out to be about 15 years. Were you going by a different name for a little while? Like your you real prior to Kalinda? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I was. Yes. I was going by um by Kellis. And that was my that's my birth name. So what happened was, okay. yeah, when we decided to well, Janelle actually decided to have alter egos. Um, they asked me what my alter ego name was, and I I said, uh, Kelly Rock. And they're like, no, nah, that's a little too corny. Because that's what I used as my publishing company when I was a kid. And then I remembered singing opera at Lincoln Center. And I used to, as a joke, I used to call myself Kelindo. I thought it was Italian. I made it up. It was definitely not Italian, but you know, I did do a lot of Italian opera uh, as a kid in the children's chorus with Sarah Jessica Parker, by the way. Uh, you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You were in a chorus with Sarah Jessica Parker? I was, I Okay, was. I didn't see that online anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little uh, fun fact. Yeah, um, I was like eight years old or something like that at the time. And um, um, you know, had a little crush on her. She was a little, you know, a little older, you know, but uh, it was cute. Um, but yeah, you know, so all those, all those operas in Italian. So I, you know, I decided to say, I'm Kilindo, the Italian <laughs> opera singer. <laughs> <You know. laughs> wow. So did Janelle go for that right away when you came they up with Kilindo? Yeah. Yes. They, they, were, they said, that's it. That's the name. So, you know, here we are. Wow, that's fantastic. I also made a little note here about the song Long Gone. I thought that was one of your really good guitar. It shows off your guitar skills. You're a really good guitar player, by the way. Thank you, Thank you very much. You know, before I talk about Sugar, I'm going to talk about this now because I was going to save this for the end, but I, I'm going to stick it in there now. I heard that one of your biggest influences was m my favorite guitar player, Brian May. Yes. So... You mentioned Queen before. So when you were young, did you find Queen and think and hear the guitar right away? How did you come to like Brian May so much? Yeah, Queen was was very mysterious to me because I was a little kid when I first heard Bohemian Rhapsody on the radio. And I didn't know who that was. <laughs> I thought it was ELO. You know, I didn't know who it was. So um, I don't know how long. It might have taken me a year to do the research because this is before the iPhone, you know. So Right, right. Coming through magazines, trying to figure out who is the band that re that wrote the song. I didn't know the name of the song either, so I thought "Telephone Line" by ELO was yeah. the Rhapsody, you know. Um, so finally, when I did find out it was Queen, I I purchased Queen Live Killers just to get good uh, good live album, right? Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing live album, and just to get a good, it's kind of like a greatest hit. So I figured I'd find the song there, and then boom, there it is. So, um, yeah, I immediately was a fan of Freddie Mercury first because of being such a great lead singer. But then when I heard the guitar, oh, my goodness, you know, the, he kind of sounds like he's playing a Strat. If a Strat and a Les Paul were, were mixed together, that's Brian May's guitar tone. So, you know, perfect. So I, I fell in love with his sound. And um, I even own a few Brian May guitars as well. And you do? I have a whole bunch of Vox amplifiers over here. I love the Vo Vox is my favorite, man. I like orange too, but Vox, you know, real yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. I got an orange here too as well. Do you use the Vox a lot when you play live? Yeah. I do. I do. I do now. Vox has a, um, I just like the, the, it kind of has a, I, can, I should say, a very beautiful feminine tone to it, uh, if that makes sense. You know, Marshalls have that real um, ballsy kind of tone. 
I've never you know? heard it described as a feminine yeah. <laughs> tone. I like that. I, I like, yeah. I got to use that. I'm going to use Vox, that. Man. Yeah. The Vox sings like an opera singer, you know, <laughs> you know, it has that kind of vibe to it. So um, I might take Vox on tour with me this year. We'll see. We'll see. I, uh, when I worked for labels pretty much my whole life until the whole record industry went down the toilet <laughs> when digital <laughs> happened. And I'll never forget. It was 90. I think I was out in LA and I found out about the Queen Mary party. And I was like, I got to go to this. And so I got on the Queen Mary. It was for the Miracle, I believe, the Miracle album. And uh, Freddie wasn't there because he was already starting to feel sick. But I was walking around and I saw Brian May and I'm like, it's going to be my only chance ever in my life. Because I saw Queen three times when I was a kid, oh. you know, a teenager. And then I saw him with Paul Rogers and not too long ago with uh, Adam... Uh, um lambert without right. lambert but i saw him and i'm like i gotta do it so i walk over there and he's talking to these guys and i kind of stood there and he looked at me and i totally had stage fright and i said 39 is great that's what i said yeah yeah, yeah. Said, oh thank you yes it is and great. i left i didn't know what else to do i was like i just had a chance to meet one of my idols and i totally choked up and couldn't talk to him Good that's for you I'm glad that you said something because I'm telling you now, if you didn't say anything, you would regret that. <laughs> I had to. I wish I would have said more because I, It's Late's my favorite song ever. I don't know if you know that song. It's on News of the World, but the guitar solo on that is killer. Oh, yes, you, is. Do you have a lot? Do you have other guitar influences besides Brian that you really look up to? Oh, absolutely. Alex Lifeson of Rush. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. he's We, I, we have a similar personality on the guitar. I like his sense of humor and his passion, you know, you can hear his energy uh, and his personality through his solos, as with anybody, you know, um, Alex Lyson, and we also share the same birthday, which I recently found out. Wow. Crazy, yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, Wes Montgomery, he's- Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, incredible, my favorite jazz guitarist of all time. Of course, Jimi Hendrix, you know, um, I love his um, explosiveness, you know. Um, who else? Joe Pass. Jazz player George Benson. Um, See, so you're all you're all over the map. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. But I kind of hear the rock in you more. You know, you seem yeah. like more of a rock guy to me. But I was yeah. going to talk to you next about the the new mix that you did of Sugar. I watched that video several times, and the first thing I have to ask you that fascinated me was I read somewhere that you went to make the video in England. And Alex Wheel was going to play in the video and she was blew you away. And then you remixed the song to add her violin. Is that true? Yeah, she um, uh, Alex, Alex um, flew out there just to be in the video. And, I, you know, she's she's a part of my ensemble as well. And um, even though there's no violin in the song, whatever she was playing, I thought it was really beautiful. And I, I even though, and the song was already recorded, but. I decided, man, we need to we need to redo this, <laughs> you know, and get her track in there. So we added that. It's a very simple addition, but it makes all the difference, you know, that human element, um, because that song has a lot of programmed uh, instruments going on, you know, right. kind of a, a hip hop uh, musical in energy, which is cool. But having that 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 classical instrument there on top of everything really makes it complete for me. So. Um... The new mix of the song, where did you do, where did you record it, first of all? I recorded it in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, uh, Nashville is kind of like my my new hub, you know. Are you in uh, Nashville now? No, I'm in Dallas, but... Uh, Dallas? Yeah, yeah, I moved, I moved during the pandemic, I moved to Dallas from New York. You know, I needed to work, you know, and everything was completely shut down, and uh, you know, it was, you know, 75 degrees here in the wintertime and uh, outdoor rock concerts were still happening. So I got down here and immediately started playing. I found some band members and uh, a trio and uh, we've been rocking out. We just played a show last night. So if I sound a little groggy, it's because of last night. <laughs> so you played in Dallas last night? Oh, yes. Which yeah, venue? Outdoor, outdoor show at a place called The Jackson. Is that and... place Trees still there? Yes. Yes, yeah. it is. I've yeah. been there. I used to tour with bands too. So I, but it's been a while and Dallas is 
You know, it's funny. Texas gets a bad rap, but in a lot of ways, the four main cities are a good place. I love Austin and San Antonio. Yeah. And, you know, Houston and Dallas aren't bad either, but right. I'm sure you like Austin. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I, I wanted to move to Austin. After doing South by Southwest, I, I became a huge fan of Austin. Which, uh, I felt like my destiny would be to eventually have a place in Austin, Texas. Wow, I, that's amazing that you ended up in Texas. I like Getting back to the song... Um, so I love the video. What made you go to England to make the video? Uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know. I felt, um, I felt rich at the time. I felt like I had <laughs> unlimited budget. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it was 2019 or 20, 2018 or something, 2019. And, um, you know. Oh, I didn't realize it was that long ago. It was. Oh. We, we held off on releasing it because of the pandemic. We kind of, I'm not sure if it was the best idea or not, but, uh, you know, but we, we didn't want to do too much during the pandemic. We just kind of felt like, Ooh, things are kind of sad right now. Let's, let's, let's batten down the hatches and kind of hold on a little bit. Um, but yeah, I went out there, I flew the band out there and, um, we had a great time, you know, it was a lot of work. I got to say, it was a lot of those, those scenes you see took many, many takes, you know, and I mean, my legs were sore and, you know, I think we were there for a week, just, you know running through videos and takes and dance steps and uh and all that and it was really really repetitive and um so that's a week's worth of performance and then months of editing so now that you have the the great video and the song i think it came out in the beginning of march yes, yes. so is there like some sort of a plan in terms of like a I don't, it's hard to say what's your radio plan because you know how radio is these days. I mean, what, yeah. it, what is it? Is there even radio out there? I mean, how right. are you approaching this? Yeah, you know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a work in progress. It's one of those things where you release something, you want to see if it uh, naturally goes viral. And then if it doesn't, you can ask all your friends and, and family to repost it for you. You know, and then hopefully it can go viral. I mean, if it's great, it'll it'll do really well. If it's not, then maybe it won't. It just shows you how much the music world has changed when an artist at your level has to talk like that. I mean, we don't have the machines anymore behind you, the big record company machine with the head, the head of promo saying, we're going to go to top 40 and AOR and blah, blah, blah. Right, you know, right. those, I worked at A&M Records, you know, so oh, I mean... Yeah. Things have like changed so much that to hear an artist of your caliber talk that way, it just shows you that, I mean, are you fine with the way things are coming on <laughs> a, like a more organic kind of, you, you're talking about this organically happening, right? Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I honestly, when I went into this business, I, assumed that it would be the same as it was when I was a kid, you know, records, record deals, record sales, um, rock being number one, you know, guitar being the number one instrument. I assumed that that would be the case, you know, and I remember, I remember deciding, do I want to be a baseball player or a musician for my career? And I looked at the salary of people like Reggie Jackson, who had a Reggie bar. He was making two hundred and something thousand dollars a year. So I was just like, eh, nah, I'm going to go with music. You know, and now it's completely the, the opposite. The backup catcher on the Mets makes like nine million a year. Are you a baseball I, fan? I am. Oh yeah, I'm a Mets and Yankees fan all the Mets way. Mets and Yankees. And Yankees, Giants, oh. and Jets. I'm all New York. What can I say? My dad was a, wow. was an all New York fan too, so I thought it was the right way to be. You know. I well, you know, it's funny. I grew up a Red Sox fan because I'm from Boston, but I, uh, my great grandfather is from it. All well, my whole family's from Italy, but my great grandfather never was anything but a Yankee fan. Yeah. He used to listen to the Yankees on the radio all the time. We'd find the radio station that played the Yankees, and he, he kind of got me into the Yankees. So I'm kind of like, I'm a more of a, I'm big, I'm a big basketball fan. The Celtics are my team, but baseball, yeah. you know, I think I like the Yankees. Now everyone in Boston is going to hate me for saying that. <laughs> uh, you're, um, it's the first time I've heard a Red Sox fan say that. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome yeah. aboard. <laughs> the Mets. No, man. After 1986, I'll never be a Mets fan. That was the most brutal thing ever. ever anyone could ever experience. Um, that, was, that was amazing. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you what you're listening to. Do you listen to a lot of new stuff, and how do you listen to music? Great question. Now I'm listening to uh, a lot of southern rock and country. I think you know, being here and 
in Dallas and doing a lot of uh, road trips. Um, I like to listen to the local radio stations, you know, get a feel for the, the town that I'm in. But the reason why I love country and, and uh, Southern rock right now is because they seem to be the uh, industry that has the most guitar. <laughs> you know, they are even playing guitar solos in this music. So I found it. I, I'm just like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I found some guitar playing. OK, it's country and it's and it's Southern rock. So let's go. Let's go with it. So that's some of the influence you hear. Interesting. In, like Long Gone and. And uh, some of my new stuff that you haven't heard yet. It's very guitar driven. Well, you know, Leonard Skinner and Allman Brothers band were guitar bands, you know? I mean, so the, real, the South, I guess, really hasn't changed that much when you yeah. think about it, right? Right. Yeah. Dwayne Allman must be someone that you you like as a guitar player. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's incredible. You know, the, the blues is something that I've always loved. And uh, now I'm a huge fan of that as well and obviously if you play rock you've got to know the blues anyway otherwise you're not really playing true rock that's right thank yeah. you for saying that yeah. just saw so buddy guy for the first time a week or two ago here and buddy guy just brought me to tears i literally i saw jimmy hendrix's influence right there you know buddy's got a sound all of his own no one sounds like him that's right that's right I watched those uh, Clapton Crossroads uh, concerts, you know, that he did. There's like four or five of them. He had Br Buddy Guy there almost every year. And I can understand why the right. guy's like really one of the great guitar legends. So, so amazing. No doubt. So um, do you have like a tour plan for your solo stuff? And what else do you have planned for the future? The tour is not planned yet. Right now, we're focusing on finishing the EP. You know, got to get that first EP out. So we have a, a nice body of work. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go on tour with um, Janelle and uh, Janelle Monet. And then um, once that's over, we'll start planning, you know, when the tour would happen. Because, I, you know, she's, uh, you know, I've got to basically, um, you know, make sure that I follow through with my with my support for her music you know she's she's been there for me for many years and you know i don't want to have a conflict where you know kalindo is on tour but uh oh janelle's on tour too so what do i do unless i'm opening for her you know or something that could that could be very nice she seems to really like you she gave gives you shout outs and stuff on stage and she's like she seems really cool she's so cool i love her very very much she's she's a wonderful uh, friend and uh incredible hardworking artist she's you know, everything you see, you know, you see the, the glam finished product, but I'm telling you all the hours and hours of brutal rehearsals and preparation that she does to be where she is. I, I have so much respect for her and uh, she's a major inspiration for me. Is there a base where you guys all get together and practice? Yeah, we usually do it in uh, in California. We usually have rehearsals in California. and L.A.? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. L.A., you know. I'm surprised you don't live. I'm surprised you never thought about living there. Oh, I thought about it. <laughs> I think about it quite a bit. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I think um, LA is a beautiful place. It's uh, it's millions of dollars more than oh, Dallas yeah. or the same <laughs> amount of real estate. But yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to move to LA too. You it's know? not an exaggeration when you say millions of dollars more. It's, it's really not. So is it a world tour you got planned with? Uh, oh, you know? yeah. It's always world. I think, well, I think with her, it's going to be um, Europe and America first. And then um, and then we'll see what happens next year. It's fantastic. Um, the first thing I'm going to do when we get off off this Zoom call is I'm going to get in touch with your publicist, Dana. I'm going to say, you got to get me one of those T-shirts, man. Yes. <laughs> got to have one of those, man. Yeah, it's awesome. yeah. For people that are listening, you'll have to go on YouTube to watch the video to know what I'm talking about. But yeah, Steve, my pleasure, man. Thank you so much, man. I know you're busy and you got a lot going on. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, man. Good luck. Thank you. All the best.